Thank you, and good evening, everybody. In 19, 1898, the first global urban planning conference was held just across the river in New York, and it was planned to last for 10 days. It didn't. They packed up and went home after three days. They went home because they couldn't understand how to subvert the problem that was plaguing major cities in the world. That problem was horse manure. And they couldn't work out what to do left after three days. We think that's funny. We look back and say, hmm, imagine that. Yet today we're used to enormous traffic jams on clover leaves. I think in a hundred years they will look just as anachronistic as we think about horse manure today. I don't think it's going to be very long before grandchildren, I don't have any, somebody's grandchildren, will be asking us to tell them about when we used to swing on the big wheel and push the things on the floor. We'll be moving to ad hoc, user pays, dynamic routing of multi-purpose vehicles. When I was younger we called those buses. But we're seeing these changes come into society. Why are the changes there? Well, I think there are three things. Firstly, there's an incentive to do something about many of the problems that are plaguing cities today. Secondly, innovation abounds. Innovation abounds in institutions like this and many others around the world in the public and private sector that tackle some of these problems. And thirdly, implementation happens very quickly around the world. Good ideas are put in place. It's difficult to be first, but there's a very long line of fast followers wanting to be second. The thing that's really powering these initiatives, in our view, is data. And, and about 10 years ago, there was an explosion in data that re resulted from what we now call the Internet of Things. Things that we didn't expect to be able to provide information suddenly do, do so. And whether that's livestock in the field, atmospheric modelling devices, or perhaps the most, the, the richest data generating source there is, each of the people here in your smartphones, we are getting terabytes of data being produced constantly. It's that data that really gives us the opportunity to make some fundamental changes into the things that we experience in part of our lives today. We think there are three major things that really define smarter cities and we've seen these emerge specifically in the last decade. The first is the generation of a huge amount of data, vast quantities, and you've all seen the kind of um, you know, discussions about how much data has been produced in relation to how much previously existed. That data is generated in all manner of places. I was in Spain recently hearing about some rubbish bins, trash cans, with Twitter accounts. Don't laugh, they've got some followers. We, we, we're seeing all sorts of intelligence being developed in things that historically weren't like that. The second major area is that data has to get somewhere. And so we see huge amounts of data being shifted through the networks. And then they get to where we think the real value is, which is in analysing that data to generate decision support and management information so we can change the way in which systems that we've grown up with are redesigned and redeveloped. People like me have made careers on a good education, good jobs, good decisions, good gut feel, good experience. That's not enough anymore. It's cold, hard facts. The next generation are just saying, show me the numbers, show me the facts. And, and so the numbers and facts they want are all about modelling. This data comes together and the first thing we need to understand is what happened? Can we develop a model to explain the data that we're looking at? Of course, if you can, you then need to test that model in real time to see whether your model holds true for what you're now observing. Because if it does, you've got a chance to do what society has tried to do and people have tried to do since the beginning of time, and that is to predict the future. The future's not Googleable. There's an awful lot of stuff you can Google. What's coming is something that you can't yet do, but modelling is helping us do that. And predictive modelling in particular is something of great value across a range of industries, like transport, like water, like emergency services and public safety, like waste management, like city operations. 
And so if I think in these three, three things, I think in these areas, I think there are four things that really define what cities around the world are doing as they tackle these projects in specific areas rather than generically being a smarter city. First of all, they're optimising assets. Typically, assets have been dumb things for a very long time. Roads, bridges, buildings, all the kind of things that we use in our daily life are for the first time taking on some intelligence which helps us better understand them and better optimise them, which is financially very important. And there's a great deal of work being done to make sure that these assets are better utilised because it's a very low-cost way to get much greater value from existing assets. The second area where this data is being applied is in additional capacity. Typically, these are big decisions, big capital decisions to change roads, build a building, put in a greenfields area, develop you know, some of the new areas that are being gentrified from, from older areas that, that no longer serve the purpose which they are designed. So, so the design and development, urban planning, the work that, that goes into building new capacity is very important. The third area that is, is perhaps one of the richest is that of innovation. You know, we're now talking about the concepts of pooled electric vehicles being used to take people to transport hubs where light rail and train and, and bus services bring them uh, to their place of work. We're seeing major changes in the way in which people work and perhaps our generation is the last where you work in one place and commute to where you live and, and much design and effort and thinking has been put in today into how do we make sure that we work and live in the same community, something that hasn't happened since before the Industrial Revolution. So innovation is a very rich area. Just the simple concept of separating drinking water from stormwater from sewerage is a huge concept that is occupying the, the focus of many de designers and, and civil engineers around the world. And the fourth thing is the concept of user pays. We all use user pays in our society every day. You've probably gathered from my accent that I'm an Australian. I have an American phone. I can use my phone to call someone in the US or in Australia or somewhere else. I know that in six weeks I'll get a bill saying that I spoke on the phone for six minutes and 12 seconds and the cost is you know, $8.19. That kind of thinking is being applied right across society. It's being applied in banking, it's being applied in insurance, in aviation, in our travel. We all get to consume what we want to consume and we're going to see much more of that as we get better understanding of how we use and consume things like transport, water, public safety, emergency management, waste. You know, we're on the cusp of seeing a dramatic change in the waste industry where the technologies are now available to recycle most of the products we generate as waste. We're involved in some projects which will soon see a dramatic reduction in the use of landfill. So these kinds of projects are all based on the data I talk about. In particular, they're based on a number of technologies that enable this. The first is cloud. We're no longer relying on IT departments to develop complex projects and tell us that there's a phased approach that will begin its release in July 2018. The organisations now that we talk to are looking for a return on investment within 90 days, which we can do. And, and cloud is something that enables that kind of capability. Analytics, I've talked a little about. Mobility, you know, we all want access to everything immediately. I know everybody in this room has a smartphone um, within arm's reach. Mobility is a critical, critical piece. Um, the third or four things after analytics is the idea of social networks, giving us rich levels of communication which we haven't had before, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And finally, the, the concepts of security and privacy uh, are very, very significant. Security is a very big issue around the world and will continue to be so. And since the history of humans, there have been malevolent humans who get up to no good and we still have those people. Uh, there's probably no more than there were at any other time, but they have the ability through electronics to wreak havoc. And so we need to spend a great deal of time and effort and focus making everything as secure as we possibly can. That's separate from privacy, uh, and I'm sure um, many of you, I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'm sure in the last few weeks you've taken an app off uh, one of the providers and when it said, do you agree to all this, you've quickly hit accept because you want the function. 
and that's a model that's very common now where people are prepared to exchange some level of privacy for a perceived benefit um, that they want to use. Security and privacy are very important concepts that need to be developed right across the board. So if we think about these kind of projects, so where do we see these Smarter Cities projects? Where do they happen? And, and, and I'd argue that you see them in two places uh, and, and it's pretty clear where those two places are. The first is where you, where you have leadership and, and there's no substitution for it. Committees, task forces, governments don't buy or develop smarter city type projects. Leaders do. And I can take you to a range of projects around the world that are uh, world leading in what they've achieved and I can introduce you to the man or woman that, that has sponsored that project and made it something very important that they deliver. And the second thing that's important is the, the, the idea that you've got to do something. And, and typically, necessity breeds excellence. Um, you know, I was somewhere recently in Europe where people were talking about some things and, you know, it didn't feel like the people were ready to pool their resources or, or get the kind of sense of community that you need in some of these projects. And, and it was kind of clear, you know, with people wearing nice clothes and linen tablecloths and Mercedes in the car park, they weren't about to opt into some of the things that need to make this transformation. I'd like to just finish um, by talking a little about transformation, which is the critical piece. The kind of projects I'm talking about are not incremental. You can't take a system and say, I've got all this thing in place and now I'm going to do this as well, because there's no more money to do that sort of thing. What's required is transformation, the ability to dramatically change how we do things. Uh, I spend a lot of time travelling away from whatever home is for me at the moment, but I'm the guy that pays my bills on my electronic banking because the finance industry has done a fantastic job of transforming itself to where the customers do their work. We're about to see the same revolution hit the health industry where we all have responsibility to manage our own health through the data that's provided. So I think there's a very big backdrop here which is the beginning of the transformation of government. I mentioned banks and airlines and insurance companies and travel and other things earlier. All of those, or all of them, have applied data, cloud, analytics, mobile and social uh, in a secure environment to change the way in which they deliver their business and government is about to do that. I was with a, a chief police officer recently who was talking about concerns with domestic violence and typically he would go and, or the force would go and manage that situation, um, but it was recurrent and, and not something that could really be resolved. And so he took the initiative to say, I need social services in here to help with this. And social services quickly said, the problem is, is not a social services issue, it's, it's a health problem, alcohol's the problem. And they eventually decided the alcohol's a problem because of depression, which resulted from unemployment. And so they've decided to develop in this community an education program to try and break the cycle that we heard about a little earlier. So this is a dramatic change for government. Historically, each of those organisations would know that person or that community or that family separately. Now they're seeing them together. So we're going to see a dramatic change in what we know as the government back office in years to come as governments begin to realise the power of the information I'm talking about and the kinds of ways in which these can be brought together and, and, and delivered in a very immediate way to change the way that we live our lives. I think national governments are retreating to national issues and cities are increasingly developing very sophisticated models of delivery with service providers from the private sector. In that sense, cities are beginning to compete with themselves and each other. And so we need to think about what is it about a particular city that distinguishes it and gives it the opportunity to really bring some of these factors together to do a few things to develop a, a fantastic vitality uh, which is needed in, in many places in the world today. Um, a high level of economic prosperity and, and that's something that cities are really competing on to bring about this kind of vitality and together these things generate a quality of life which we see in the cities regularly hitting the newspapers and the media as those that have the most attractive things which cover everything from innovation and high level ed education throughout a, a young person's life through to developing jobs and new industries and, and really leading the way in economic prosperity. So I think these things come from uh, a, you know, an incredible impatience 
and, and a, an incentive to do something, innovation um, that comes quickly as a result of that, and then the implementation of this very quickly to change the way in which we lead our lives. Thank you all very much.